Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. What, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 14th of May 2023. The articles that we shall be covering today has been displayed on the screen. And let us now begin with the discussion. Groundwater exploitation is silently sinking the ground beneath India's feet. And this article talks about basically declining groundwater across the country but specifically in few areas of Punjab, Haryana, Delhi and how it is being manifested into various kinds of problems that the local inhabitants are facing in these areas. Now if you focus on the GS Paper 1 syllabus, important geophysical phenomena as well as features, their location and changes in critical geographical feature including water bodies is a part of the syllabus. Groundwater being one of the most important reservoirs of fresh water on the surface of the earth and also below the surface of the earth will definitely get covered under this part of the topic. From the perspective of UPSC examination, it is very very important for us to discuss the challenges with respect to the groundwater. The challenges with respect to the declining quantity and as well as with respect to the declining quality of the groundwater which basically means the pollutants. So we will start the discussion by first understanding how groundwater actually works, what it is, where are the major reservoirs of the water and what is the major use of the groundwater in India. Then we will move on and understand why these challenges are being faced in our country and that is with respect to some very very systematic issues and we will see that how it is due to systemic issues in India's governance. And then finally we will of course learn the way forward as to how to tackle this problem. So let us now begin the discussion. So if you have to define groundwater. So if you have to define groundwater, it is basically water found underground in cracks and spaces in soil, sand and rocks beneath the surface of the earth. So as you can see, this is the top layer which is the soil, then this is a layer of a rock which is not permeable to water and so that is why it is called aquitard. So any water seeping in from above, that is from the soil, will not percolate downwards and beneath this layer you have a layer of a rock which holds water which is called an aquifer which have a lot of pores which are connected with each other and so the water is found in these pores and this is the groundwater we are talking about below that of course we have another layer which does not permits the flow of water and so that is why usually the groundwater is trapped between two layers which do not allow water to pass through now most of the aspirants have a tendency to visualize groundwater as a flowing stream of river, which is partially incorrect. Why I say partially is because of course the groundwater is flowing beneath the surface of the earth but it is, full, but it is flowing at a very very slow speed, sometimes as low as 1 cm per year. Now here is the challenge. If you extract the water from this point to be utilized in industry or in agriculture, and if that extraction rate is much faster than what the water is coming from upstream, of course what you are going to do is that you are going to deplete the water. You are going to create a region in this layer where there will be no water simply because the water flowing in from behind is not the same rate as you are extracting the water and so that is why and so that is why the groundwater level depletes when you have a higher extraction rate as compared to the recharge rate so that is with respect to the quantity but what happens when you deplete the quality and how it happens so these are agricultural fields and when you use a lot of pesticides and chemicals and when it goes through the soil of course it will be prevented in this case but not all places have a non-permeable layer and so you have a lot of instances as you can see in the image where the water along with all the chemicals can directly percolate into the groundwater and which ultimately leads to the deterioration in the quality of the groundwater which leaves it unfit for utilization by humans. Now since we cannot see groundwater and so that is why often the importance of the quality and the quantity of groundwater is underestimated. 
Out of all the water present on the surface of the earth, only 3% is fresh water, which means only 3% of the overall mass of the water on the earth, only 3% can be utilized by humans for carrying out various activities. And out of that, around 68.7% or around 69% is locked up in ice caps and glaciers. So, of course, that is beyond our reach. Whereas only 0.3% is the surface water. So the rivers, lakes and swamps constitute only 0.3% and so you can see that around one third of the total fresh water on the surface of the earth is groundwater. And so that is why it is very very important for us to preserve one of the most important and also the largest after ice caps reservoirs of the water on the earth. And so of course the way we have been using groundwater since centuries have led to a lot of deterioration especially in last 50 to 60 years and we'll try to understand how and what are the reasons behind it and so let us start by first understanding the decline in water level in the underground water so of course we have seen how over exploitation and unscientific extraction the extraction rate which is higher than what is being recharged will obviously lead to the decline in the quantity of the water but the way we have been doing agriculture in our country has led to inland salinity of the groundwater. So you must have experienced that a lot of times when you drink water, it tastes very, very saline. And the reason behind that is due to the practice of surface water irrigation without consideration of groundwater status. The gradual rise of groundwater level with time has resulted in water logging and heavy evaporation in semi-arid regions, arid or semi-arid regions, and that has led to a lot of salinity of the groundwater. And this is a particular problem in areas of Rajasthan, Haryana, as well as in Punjab. Then you have the problem of coastal salinity inside the groundwater level. So we have seen that we have extracted fresh water a lot from the groundwater. So what this withdrawal of fresh groundwater does is that it allows the coastal aquifers to intrude into the groundwater or the fresh water, the fresh water aquifers in the coastal regions. So what it basically means is that the saline groundwater has slowly and steadily started to move inside the freshwater aquifers and this is a typical problem in the areas of Tamil Nadu as well as in Gujarat. So we are facing the problem of decline in the groundwater, inland salinity and also the increasing salinity of the coastal aquifers. But apart from this, you have a major problem of contamination of the groundwater with these chemicals which are arsenic, nitrates, fluoride, iron and uranium. And so let us look into what are the causes, what are the worst impacted areas due to these chemicals and also what is the problem, why we should be concerned because of these contaminants. Starting with the pollutant which is creating the most news in last five years that is arsenic pollution and due to which many blocks and districts in West Bengal are being impacted. Its chronic exposure leads to black foot disease and also has been reported as a leading cause of lung as well as skin cancer. Now how does arsenic ends up in groundwater? And to illustrate this, consider this as the top layer of the soil and the blue dots represent the aquifer. And so initially, 100 years ago, what people did was that they dug well and that was very shallow because we did not extract much water till then. But gradually what has happened is that due to increasing removal of groundwater, the water level is going down and down and down and because of which the wells which are now being dug are extremely deep. And in the areas of Bengal, there are rock formations at the deeper level which contain arsenic. And so as the wells are going deeper, the amount of arsenic they are taking in is increasing in number. Apart from that, there are various kinds of chemical pesticides which contain significant amounts of arsenic. Once released into the land, they leach into the groundwater. So that is about arsenic pollution in groundwater. Then we have nitrate pollution and this problem is being faced across the country. Its chronic exposure leads to blue baby syndrome and it is also known as something which I am not able to pronounce but the bottom line is that the nitrate concentration across the country unlike arsenic which is limited to a very small area the nitrate pollution is found and increasingly being found across the country. 
Now what is the cause of nitrate pollution in the ground water? And that is due to the surface leaching and you will see that whatever we use for example the nitrogen based fertilizer we use ultimately whatever is extra not utilized by the plant washes down with the water then all the septic waste municipal waste which is released into the open or into the rivers ultimately leaches down to the ground water and so that is why you will find nitrate pollution across the country then we have a problem of fluoride pollution and this is a main problem in the state of Punjab and its chronic exposure leads to neuromuscular disorders and teeth deformity or also known as yellow teeth. Now both human as well as natural causes are responsible behind increasing fluoride concentration. So natural causes would include rocks which have higher concentration of fluoride the leaching of which is releasing fluoride into the groundwater. But here we are mainly going to focus on the human reason because it has increased in last 30 to 40 years. Now here due to brick planes and other polluting industries whatever waste they are releasing into their surrounding is leaching into the groundwater leading to higher concentration of fluorine in the groundwater. Then in areas of Assam and West Bengal you have iron concentration which is increasing every year and then finally you have problem of uranium higher uranium concentration at various places in our country now here again you have to focus on a similar diagram as in the case of arsenic where the water level is declining and what it is doing is that it is exposing the natural rocks which contain uranium now as long as they are covered with water they are in the reduced form but as soon as the layer of water is removed from them what they do is that these uranium atoms and molecules come in contact with oxygen because now the pore spaces are empty and air can simply seep in and this oxidation of uranium in the natural reservoirs is leading to their release in the groundwater and its chronic exposure causes chronic kidney disease and whatnot. So these are the main challenges which is being faced in our country as far as groundwater is concerned. Now if it is being phased, there must be some very very important systemic issues with the way we are managing the groundwater. And starting with the very nature of the groundwater, the decentralized nature of the groundwater use. So basically and practically anyone can dig a well and start utilizing the groundwater. And if you invest some money, you can do it more efficiently with the help of pumps or submersibles. And so it makes it very hard to keep a check on over exploitation and pollution of groundwater. And generally in India, the landowners enjoy the de facto right to extract groundwater under their land. But the problem is that the water which they are extracting is not, is not limited to the parcel of land beneath their houses or homes. But if you extract higher, the groundwater from the surrounding areas would also be sucked in and so higher the pump capacity, higher is the extraction capacity and that is one of the biggest problem in our country. Then the problem is agriculture. The way we are doing agriculture ensures that 90% of the water for which the groundwater is being extracted is used in agriculture and so if we are able to do something over here if we are able to reform the ways through which we are doing agriculture a lot will change as far as groundwater is concerned then there are three factors which relate to the governance of the groundwater so we know that groundwater is primarily the responsibility of central groundwater board and straight groundwater agencies however there are only few observation stations in our country that cover all the essential parameters for water quality and hence the data which is obtained are not decisive on the water quality status. Further, the monitoring ability is doubtful as these agencies lack adequate staff because you need technical abilities in order to be able to do research on the samples and also there is a limitation on the amount of fund or the resource which is being allocated to these bodies. And then we have a problem of conflict of interest. You need to understand that state pollution control boards in our country perform the function of monitoring the pollution as well as enforcing pollution control norms. Now this is a big conflict of interest. If you are failing to enforce a norm and if you are not being able to do it properly, you are going to dilute your monitoring because if you make a strict monitoring 
ultimately you are going to be responsible for it and so that is one of the important reasons why we are lacking so much on groundwater pollution so as an aspirant whenever we talk about problems it is important for us to have a clear cut idea about the solutions as well so almost all of us agree that there is a need for us to enhance the agricultural efficiency the efficiency in the way we are utilizing the water in our agriculture and so that could be by designing new varieties of crops which take less and less water or that could also deal with the groundwater recharge so what that basically means is that you have to make sure that a lot of water which falls on the surface does not runs away in the ocean and you have to make sure that a good chunk of that goes to the groundwater and so there are various ways to do that you can find them in the ncrt books as well but there exists something which is known as a master plan for artificial recharge of groundwater which was developed by central groundwater board cwgb this was done in 2013 but it is not enforced in true spirit so far it is a very very comprehensive document and so there is a need for the government to implement it in full spirit then a lot of powers have been given to the government less under water act but more under the environmental protection act 1986 which has given blanket powers to the government to do anything for protecting environment and environment can include anything and everything and so the government can utilize these powers if it is serious about protecting the quality and quantity of the groundwater now there is a scheme known by the name of atal bhujal yojana which is a central sector scheme and the fund for this particular scheme is coming from world bank but still it is not being extended throughout the country but rather it is limited to just the seven states and so there is a need for this particular scheme to be extended throughout the country and then finally and then finally in 2016 the union government launched national project on aquifer management the project proposes to cover around 1.4 million square kilometer under aquifer mapping between 2017 and 22 which is still in progress but needs to be completed so that we have a clear cut understanding about our ground water resources so from the perspective of mains examination this topic is very very important but also from the perspective of prelims examination the mechanisms through which these pollutants reach the ground water is also very very important keep these facts and concepts in mind and let us now move on to the next news Now next article for discussion deals with science and technology. Gaganyaan parachutes for re-entry capsules sent to ISRO facility in Bangalore. And so indigenously developed parachutes for the safe return of the capsule that will carry astronauts under the proposed Gaganyaan program are set to undergo fitment test at ISRO in Bangalore in July. And so this has brought the Gaganyaan, the project which envisages demonstration of human space flight capability by launching crew of 3 members to an orbit of 400 kilometers for a 3 day mission and bring them back safely to earth by landing in Indian sea waters is something which is very very important from the perspective of civil services examination. Not only does it covers in GS3 syllabus under achievements of Indians in science and technology, indigenization of technology and developing new technology, but also in the prelims examination, UPSC has asked questions related to space programs every year. A case in point is 2016 prelims examination when two such questions were asked. For example, the first question was with reference to AstroSat. The astronomical observatory launched by India which of the following statements is are correct statement 1 other than USA and Russia India is only country to have launched a similar observatory into space now this is incorrect as India is not the third but the fourth country and third country was Japan and hence this statement is incorrect Similarly the second statement is also incorrect as it says that AstroSat is a 2 ton satellite placed in an orbit at 1650 km above the surface of the earth. Now this statement is also incorrect because the approximate mass of AstroSat is around 1500 kg and not 2000 and also it is placed in the orbit of 650 km and not 1650 km and hence the right answer was neither one nor two. Similarly another question consider the following statements with respect to Mangalyaan launched by ISRO the statement one said it is also called the Mars orbiter mission if you remember it was abbreviated as mom 
The second statement says it made India the second country to have a spacecraft orbit the Mars after USA. Now this statement is incorrect as not only NASA from USA but also Soviet Union as well as China have done so. And hence India is not the only country after USA to have done so. And third statement is correct because it made India the only country to be successful in making its spacecraft orbit the mass in its very first attempt and hence the right answer is C1 and 3. So you can understand that a very deep insights into space programs especially the ones launched by ISRO are very important from the perspective of prelims examination. Also in mains 2019 under GS3 paper, UPSC has asked recently what is India's plan to have its own space station and how will it benefit our space program and hence it becomes important for us to cover Gaganyaan in detail. So it needs to be highlighted here clearly that Gaganyaan is not going to be space station. It is just going to be a project for first human space flight program of India. It shall have three components under which two shall be unmanned and one shall be a human space flight which will be launched in December 2021. Now as far as the carrying capacity of the space flight is concerned, ISRO plans to send three astronauts to a low earth orbit of 300 to 400 kilometers on GSLV Mark III vehicle. So keep in mind that a low earth orbit is characterized as one having an altitude of 300 to 400 kilometers and the carrier will be very powerful GSLV Mark III which has been indigenously built by ISRO. So apart from humans, is ISRO going to launch humanoids as well? Yes, ISRO is planning to launch humanoids before it can launch the humans into space for carrying out microgravity experiments. The successful implementation of Gaganyaan mission would propel India's image in global forum as it would be fourth country to send such a mission after Russia, USA and China. Now let us understand few important technologies which will be essential for successful conduct of Gaganyaan mission. Now the first and most important component would be a rocket or a carrier which would take the crew module into the space. Now GS will be Mach 3 which is an indigenously built cryogenic engine is capable of delivering such a heavier payload into the space. Now as far as the cryogenic engine is concerned these are the engines which work on fuel stored at a very low temperature and it enhances its efficiency both in terms of range as well as the payload. And this is the rocket which will take the crew to the low earth orbit of 300 to 400 kilometers. Now as far as the crew module is concerned, this will be the capsule in which our astronauts will be carried into low earth orbit. So the rocket is going to carry two kinds of modules. The first is crew module and the second is service module. Now this service module will carry many other technologies and safety features which are designed to protect this crew module. And crew module in itself will house astronauts. As far as the people who will go into space, now that selection procedure has already been conducted and people from Indian Air Force have been selected. Crew module atmospheric re-entry technology is the main thing which separates the normal satellites from a manned mission. Now you see satellites that are launched for communication or remote sensing are meant to remain in the space and they are not expected to come back to the earth. However, a manned spacecraft needs to come back to the surface. And while entering or re-entering into earth's atmosphere, the spacecraft needs to withstand very high temperature created due to friction. And hence, it is extremely important for the overall system to have a care technology or crew module atmospheric re-entry technology. Now, as far as the progress of ISRO is concerned, it has already conducted a successful experiment in 2014 itself and hence ISRO is ready with this technology. Next in line is crew escape system or pad aboard test. Rockets in themselves are extremely complicated machines and due to a minor error a whole mission can collapse and burn into ashes in few seconds and since these are manned missions we need to be extra cautious and hence a crew escape system has been designed which is an emergency accident avoidance measure designed to quickly get astronauts and their spacecrafts away from the launch vehicle if a malfunction occurs 
occurs during the initial stages of launch. And it is heartening to note that ISRO has completed first successful test of this technology as well. So we saw that as far as these three technologies are concerned, ISRO is ready with the launch vehicle which is GSLV Mach 3. ISRO is also ready with CARE as well as pad aboard test crew escape system. Now for manned missions, in order for the humans to survive in the space, crew module carrying these human beings must have conditions inside suitable for humans to live comfortably. And for that, environmental control and life support system has been designed. It will carry out four main tasks. First is obviously maintenance of steady cabin pressure and air composition without which humans can't survive. It will also efficiently remove carbon dioxide and other harmful gases automatically. It will control the temperature and humidity of the cabin as well as it will manage other parameters and take immediate action for example fire detection and suppression. Now this is the only technology with which ISRO is not ready so far and the layout, design and configuration of this technology has been finalized but it has not been tested yet. So this is that component of Gaganyaan which needs to be immediately prioritized by ISRO. So the way UPSC has asked questions, it is not sufficient to just memorize on the objectives. But you also need to keep a track on what are the various technologies which have been developed by ISRO in order to achieve the mission objectives. Let's now move on to the next news. Next article for discussion deals with a disaster. Myanmar, Bangladesh brace for cyclone Mocha. So in this regard, we will go through a discussion which is focused towards the categorization of a cyclone into various categories and how does a depression when it gets itself converted into a cyclone or a super cyclone gets its name, in this case Mocha. And for this, we will go through a discussion which we have already done in daily news simplified videos in case of Amphan cyclone. Now as far as the basics of cyclone is concerned, it is expected that you will go back to the basic book which is NCRT or any other standard textbook and you will understand what cyclone is and what are the basic conditions which lead to the generation of a cyclonic storm and in this case tropical cyclone. But in this discussion we are going to focus on a very very important piece of information which is generally not given in the textbook and that has been asked in mains as well. In 2013 UPSC asked the recent cyclone on the east coast of India was called Felin. How are the tropical cyclones named across the world? Elaborate. So you can see that generally the standard textbooks do not contain the information as to how tropical cyclones are named and what are various categories and how are they categorized into those various categories. So let us now begin the discussion. Now as far as any kind of cyclone is concerned, after all it begins at a low pressure and as soon as the winds over oceans start to converge at a point, it starts to grow into depression, then further into deeper depression, then comes the cyclonic storm, severe cyclonic storm and finally the super cyclone which Amphan is right now. So how do we differentiate between a moving low pressure and a moving super cyclone and that is done on the basis of surface winds which this cyclone generates. Although it is not very important to remember the cutoff speeds of each of them but it is extremely important to remember category of depression is limited up to around 60 kilometers per hour and any kind of low pressure which gives rise to the wind speeds higher than that of 60 kilometers per hour will be categorized into storm and as the speed increases into severe cyclonic storm and super cyclone. And as you know that currently the surface winds around Amphan have speeds around 240 km per hour and hence it has been rightly placed under super cyclone category. Now this is a screenshot of the notification released by IMD this morning and you can see the forecast of IMD related to this cyclone for today, tomorrow and day after tomorrow and you can see that the speed of the surface winds is continuously declining. Now it is important for you to understand that why does a tropical cyclone declines in intensity as it makes a landfall. And similarly this is going to happen with Amphan as well with 
continuous decline in wind speed and hence the corresponding decline in the category from super cyclone storm today to cyclone and then finally depression after two days. But the problem is that when it will make a landfall in Bengal, it will still be extremely severe cyclonic storm capable of inducing extreme devastation. Now from the perspective of prelims examination, it is also important to know that what are the various local names for these tropical cyclones. Now these tropical cyclones are known as hurricanes around Central America and North America. They are known as cyclones in Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea and they are known as typhoons in China Sea and Western Pacific Ocean. Now if you see I have drawn these arrows in a particular manner. Do you understand the reason behind why these arrows are drawn in that specific manner? Now moving on to actually answering the question which was asked in 2013 prelims. That is about the nomenclature. You keep on hearing these names like Amphan, Fani, Okhi, Felin. From where does these names come and how are they allotted? So first and foremost, just like any other climatic phenomena, why can't we just code them? And why is there a need to humanize these cyclones? Now there are two reasons for that. Now the first is simultaneous multiplicity, which basically means that tropical cyclones can last for a week or more. Therefore there can be more than one cyclone at a time. And hence weather forecasters give each tropical cyclone a name to avoid confusion. Similarly, adopting names of cyclones makes it easier for people to remember as opposed to numbers and other technical researchers terms which will make it extremely difficult for the common people to connect to these climatic phenomena and naming them makes it easier for the scientific community like IMD to create awareness among general public and disseminate warning signals. Now to the main question is how are they named? From where did Amphan come? Cyclones that form in every ocean basin across the world are named by Regional Specialized Meteorological Centers or acronymed as RSMC and each such center has been allocated an ocean basin. And similarly the responsibility behind nomenclature as well as notification regarding tropical cyclones in, in Northern Indian Ocean Basin has been given to IMD which is Indian Meteorological Department. It is responsible to name the tropical cyclones that have formed over Bay of Bengal as well as Arabian Sea as and when they reach the cutoff intensity which we have discussed in the last slide. Now you must be wondering that how is it acceptable for the neighboring countries of India to accept the notification by IMD. You should note that World Meteorological Organization or WMO has allocated these responsibility across the world to these six centers. And it was mutually agreed that IMD will take the responsibility in this region. Now first let us discuss few rules which are important to understand the nomenclature. And that is that there is a set pattern of order which has to be followed, which cannot be ignored. And IMD cannot randomly choose a name, it has to follow an order. Now each name shall be used only once and it retires then and there and it can never be used again. For example, the name Amphan has been given to the super cyclone which is hitting India tomorrow. Now this name has retired and it can never be used again for any cyclone. Now you know that the cyclones have a tendency to cross basins. For example, a super cyclone might emerge here which is not the territory which is notified by IMT and might continue to enter into Indian Ocean Basin. But in that case, it shall carry its name which was given to this particular cyclone in that basin. So as the cyclone migrates from one ocean to another, its name does not change. Now WMO maintains a rotating list of names which are appropriate for each tropical cyclone basin. Now first, the names of the countries which are bordering that particular basin are arranged alphabetically. And as you can see that B, I, M, M, O, P, S, T. These are alphabetically arranged. And a lot of names have already been submitted by these countries. These names submitted by each country are arranged in rows. So all these names have been submitted by Bangladesh and all the names in the row 2 have been submitted by India and similarly all other countries. Now the first cyclone which will be named shall start from the first row of column 1 and continue sequentially last row in the last column. 
so first all the names in this column shall be exhausted which means all the names given by countries has been exhausted once then we will move to next column and then next column and finally and finally we have arrived at Amphan which is right here and you can see that this name was submitted by Thailand so in 2020 the first name to be used will be the one not used yet from the list below and that turns out to be Amphan and if you have been reading newspaper regularly you must have seen that in 2019 Fani, Vayu, Bulbul struck India so this is the row which was exhausted in 2019 similarly going back these rows were exhausted depending upon how many cyclones were hit now you should not get confused that these columns mean year wise allocation it could happen that in one of the years two columns could be used and in some years even half of the column remains unutilized now on the basis of what we have discussed so far if i give to you this chart and ask you that after Amphan, what will be the name of the next cyclone in Bay of Bengal? Can you guess from this particular chart? Now to follow the same procedure, it will start from the first row and first column in this cell and it will be named as Nisak. And then first this column will be utilized. Hence the first cyclone shall be named as Nisak followed by Gati followed by Nivar. So this is as far as nomenclature of tropical cyclone is concerned. It is important to keep in mind these things both from the perspective of mains as well as prelims examination. There is an article in today's The Hindu, UK sees success in mitochondrial replacement therapy. We will discuss this article piece by piece. As the name suggests, mitochondrial replacement therapy, it has something to do with mitochondria. Mitochondria is one of the cell organelle. In the cytoplasm of the cell, you have centrally located nucleus and you have various other cell organelle like chloroplast, like ribosome, like Golgi apparatus. It is this one of the cell organelle that we are interested in, mitochondria. Mitochondria is found in all human cells and by the knowledge of class 7 biology, you would know that mitochondria is the powerhouse of all the cells. It is responsible for producing energy for the cells through cellular respiration. Respiration, you understand, involves uptake of oxygen. Mitochondria converts oxygen and the nutrients flowing into the cell into adenosine triphosphate, ATP. It is the chemical energy that powers the cell. ATP is also nicknamed as the energy currency of the body. But any mutation that damages mitochondria would tend to affect more the energy hungry organs. It can result in a range of energy problems such as weak muscles, heart disease, liver problem, also neurological disorders. And once it happens, then there is no cure. To perform its function, mitochondria has its own small genome called as mitochondrial DNA. It's very small. Mitochondrial DNA just contains 37 genes. The chromosomal DNA, which is inside the nucleus of the cell, it has around 20,000 to 25,000 genes. There is a very small circular segment of mitochondrial DNA and it has only 37 genes. But in the chapter of reproduction that we studied in class 7th or maybe class 8th, there was no mention of mitochondrial DNA because unlike the nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA does not contain instructions for our biological traits. It is only concerned with the functioning of mitochondria. It codes for the production of certain transfer RNA, some of the RNAs that enables mitochondria to function well and to act as the powerhouse of the cell. So mitochondrial DNA has nothing to do with the way the child will look. The color of the skin, the color of the eye, the height, the curliness in the hair, none of the biological trait would be linked to mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA having only 37 genes responsible only for energy production. But malfunctioning of energy production does affect many of the tissues and organs. It is estimated that 1 in 4000 children are born with mitochondrial disease. And the peculiar thing about these mitochondrial diseases is that mitochondrial diseases are maternally inherited because mitochondrial DNA is inherited maternally. It is inherited only from the mother, almost only from the mother. There are many reasons for this. 
One of the reason is the sperm cell, it hardly contains any mitochondria. It does, but the amount of mitochondria in the sperm cell is very limited. In the mid piece of the sperm cells, there are few mitochondria that provide energy for the sperm cell to move and swim towards the egg. But it hardly contains mitochondria, so they contribute little or almost no mitochondria to the embryo. Whatever little amount of mitochondria is there in the sperm, it tends to die out as the sperm swims up in the fallopian tube. So the cytoplasm of the embryo, the first fertilization between the egg and the sperm cell, the cytoplasm of that cell almost exclusively comes from the egg cell. And you know mitochondria is there in the cytoplasm, so embryo obtains its mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA which is inside the mitochondria almost exclusively from the egg cell during fertilization. And that's the reason mitochondrial DNA and for that matter mitochondrial related diseases are inherited maternally. Now there are some related things regarding this. You know that mutation naturally happens and when the mother's egg cells are developing some mitochondria with mutations may accumulate in certain eggs and may be absent in certain eggs and this phenomena is called as heteroplasmy. So by chance in the process of mutation one egg may contain a higher level of mutant mitochondria and if that egg is used for fertilization then the mutant mitochondria will be passed to greater extent in the embryo and hence the severity of disease in the offspring will be higher and it is suggested that if the lineage remains pure if in the family lineage there are not multiple ancestors, then there are a higher risk of transmitting accumulated mutant mitochondria from mother to child over generations. Now you have understood two things. One is there is role of mitochondrial DNA in functioning of body related to energy uptake. And malfunctioning of mitochondrial DNA will weaken the tissues and organs. And number two, you have also understood that mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited. It is inherited almost exclusively from the mother. These two things will help us understand the third thing, mitochondrial replacement therapy. So if it is known that mother is carrying muted mitochondria and mitochondrial disease runs in the family, then something called as mitochondrial replacement therapy can be carried out so that the offspring doesn't have that disease. Disease is linked with mitochondrial DNA. For offsprings to not have the disease, they must not have that mitochondrial DNA. So the mitochondrial DNA must be removed from the egg of the mother because that's where it's going to come from. But you need mitochondrial DNA for the function of mitochondria. So after removal of mother's mitochondria from the egg cell, it has to be filled by someone else. So a new mitochondria must come from another female donor, not male donor. It has to come from another female donor. The reason is that the sperm cell from the father and from the biological mother will form one zygote. You will fuse these two together and you will also fuse these two together. You will remove the mitochondrial DNA from here and you will remove the nucleus from here. So the nuclear DNA, the chromosomes are all out. This is only cytoplasm having mitochondria, which in turn has mitochondrial DNA. So fusing these two will work it out. There are other techniques of doing it as well, but fundamentally this is what happens. You remove the nuclear DNA from the female donor. You only use the mitochondrial DNA. And from the regular zygote, you remove the mitochondrial DNA and, and use her mitochondrial DNA. Fundamentally, this is what it is. So the mitochondria of biological mother is replaced by another healthy female donor. But the baby is not going to look like this female donor because her chromosomes, her nuclear DNA has not been used at all. But there are concerns related to mitochondrial replacement therapy just like any new biotechnology related techniques. First of all like CRISPR, gene editing, gene silencing or any other biotechnology related technique we do not know as to what will be the long-term impact. The same concern we have for GM crops. Mixing of mitochondria can impact traits in unforeseen ways about which we may not know. It was in 2015 when for the first time UK government allowed for mitochondrial replacement therapy. So it has been just 8 years since this therapy has been used 
and around five children so far have born in United Kingdom using this therapy. So the long term impact of this is yet to be seen. This kind of technique may also create designer baby mentality. Parents may want to create a child with certain traits or characteristics as per their desire and all it takes is to remove few genes from here and there. Now you will also appreciate that in this replacement therapy the new mitochondria that you are adding that must not be having any mutation otherwise it will defeat the entire purpose. So you have to be absolutely sure first of all that the female donor herself is not carrying any mutation. There is only one facility in the entire United Kingdom that has license to carry out this therapy because technologically it's a very challenging procedure. If not carefully done, the zygote and the baby that comes out of it may have complications. There are huge ethical concerns altering the human genome. There are religious implications because in the process you are killing some zygote. As I have explained you here, you are doing the fusion and then you are destroying some things in the fused egg and sperm cell. And if you strictly look at it from the pro-life perspective, this is killing a baby. Obviously the cost will be very high and this is not cure. You are preventing the disease to be transferred. But for people who cannot afford this therapy, for them there is no cure. So the criticism is rather more research must be diverted towards curing it and not just preventing it through a very exorbitantly costly therapy. UPSC in 2021 has asked this question in the prelims exam. In the context of hereditary diseases, consider the following statement. Passing on mitochondrial diseases from parent to children can be prevented by mitochondrial replacement therapy either before or after in vitro fertilization of egg. As we have touched upon it very slightly but we did not go into the detail of the mechanism of it because that will be beyond the scope of UPSC exam. But you do understand the removal of mitochondria, it can be done after fusion with the sperm, it can also be done before it. But the fundamental thing is you remove it and replace it by another mitochondrial DNA of healthy female donor. So the statement is plain and straight, you can do it before or after the fertilization of egg. The statement is correct. The child inherits mitochondrial disease entirely from mother and not from father. It sounds like an extreme statement because here I pointed it out that the disease comes almost exclusively from the egg cell and we gave the reason for that as well. The sperm cell has very little mitochondria and almost all of it dies in the, in the process of it finding the egg cell and getting fused with it. But if you really google it, you'll find some of the research papers that suggests that in the rare event, some of the mitochondria from the sperm cell may survive and may be present in the zygote. In the rare eventuality, mitochondria from the sperm cell may also be there. So if they would have written almost here, almost entirely from mother, we would have been very comfortable with this statement. But the father's mitochondria getting into the fertilized egg is a rare event. It's exception rather than rule. So looking at it from that perspective, the statement has to be correct. I'll also tell you one thing, do not try to find extreme exceptions in the statement given by UPSC. Take it in general sense, you will always get the answer right.